Good morning, Nikita. Good morning, Caroline. So, uh, we are now connected on Instagram Live, and this is to introduce the program together, Una Lettera dal Fronte, a letter from the front, which will begin very soon to be screened in the Castello di Rivoli Theatre. Uh, so, I would like to, first of all, before speaking about the program, ask you how you are, and what you are doing, and what you are thinking. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carolina. Greetings uh, from Kiev. Uh, I'm uh, now in a art gallery, which uh, is turned to a bomb shelter. Its space was a bomb shelter before, during Soviet times, during Cold War. So it's a quite a safe place, but it's in a very center of the city, surrounded by museums and the building of a university. Uh, so today's uh, 15th day of uh, Russian invasion and uh, also it's a part of war which is going on for eight years already since 2014 i guess yes uh, uh, nikita i'm going to uh, uh stop you right there for a moment and uh, go back to our istanbul biennial in 2015 when you showed a piece called shelter you are in a bomb shelter now, and that piece included an installation with two levels. There was a bomb shelter on the bottom, and there was a, a scene on the top, like a diorama, where a bomb had gone through the ceiling. That piece seemed like a premonition of now, but you are actually about to speak to me right now, about how this war did not begin 15 days ago. Yes, uh, this war goes on for eight years. And if in the very beginning it was uh, visible uh, to international community, it was in media, then Donbass and Crimea turned to be rather invisible places or rather not so interesting. It's like uh, this uh, catastrophe which is removed to periphery to make center remain clean and safe. And uh, there on peripheries, there are plenty of wounds which are rotting all the time. And in some moment, this sepsis touches the center again. Like I know that uh, lots of people of the West were really surprised about what happened on uh, February 24th. But uh, for Ukrainians, it uh, wasn't like so big surprise. Lots of us knew that uh, catastrophe will move from the east to the center, from east to west. Uh, so yeah, we are now not just on a 15th day of catastrophe, but on uh, like... Uh, Seventh year. Yeah, 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 eighth year. Eighth year. And can you remind the other people who are watching us about that piece? called Shelter, and you are in a shelter now. Yes, I made uh, it uh, on uh, Salt Waters, a theory of uh, thought forms exhibition, which you created. Uh, the installation was in uh, Istanbul Modern Museum, and uh, it was a huge construction, like uh, actually a small building or like uh, something between a theater box and a dollhouse, 
with two levels on a top level. There was a, a ruin with stuffed animals. I repeated the photo from a local history museum in Donetsk, destroyed by uh, shelling. Uh, this, uh, this was a very well-known photo for a certain period. There were stuffed animals standing in between of ruins. But I added uh, rubber tires to the ruin, transforming it to something looking like barricade on Maidan. Like barricade and uh, ruin, they uh, seem quite similar in, uh, let's say, some morphological sense. But barricade is optimistic. It's about subjectivity, it's about mm. uh, being ready to defend yourself. And the ruin is about uh, history which uh, like falls on our heads. The lower level of construction uh, was like a bomb shelter, like gray concrete space with a very low ceiling and with uh, beds with several levels. But I use uh, such beds which uh, are often used in agriculture to grow like mushrooms uh, and to grow some uh, like plants which uh, don't need much light. There Hello. Uh, there were no people in museum. So there was a ruined museum and a shelter top level and lower level. Yes, and somehow the piece was a fraction or an equation that spoke to the horror behind also some form of rational thinking or rationality and the irrational that's in somehow the rational projects as if the rational were actually irrational. This makes me think of the dialectic of the Enlightenment and Adorno and the school of uh, Frankfurt. Um, were you thinking about this somehow irrationality of the rationality of war? Uh, yes, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, rather, yes. Rather, yes. It's like uh, being uh, in between of very different logics. Like logics of those who make decisions to start the war, to use certain uh, weapons of mass destruction, and the logics of those who survive is very different. And it's so weird that uh, those first formally are political representatives of the second. <laughs> uh, in fact, it just not so. During the war, it's obvious that political elites don't represent the interests of the population. They are totally like disconnected. This, uh, I'd say in a very like uh, simple level. But at the same time, the rationality of war has something to do with uh, like experience and uh, like political culture, political thinking of modernity. Yes. So there is something uh, that the surrealist artists understood about the irrationality of modernity, which became surrealism and was also a reaction to World War I and to some of the horrors of, for example, aerial bombing. Can I ask you a question uh, about the, the sky in 
Kiev and in Ukraine. Uh, your president is asking insistently to stop the uh, flyover Ukraine. And this has not been done. And it is not done because it would drag the other countries into maybe a nuclear war. Maybe that is what people are afraid of. Uh, why uh, do you think that it would be good, because you have also written this in your Instagram, I think, or somewhere, why do you think it would be a good thing in the long run to stop the airplanes above Ukraine? Yeah, uh, I have a very simple answer, because uh, each day brings new victims, uh, like Russian uh, use missiles and uh, aviation and uh, each day they kill people uh, like yesterday the hospital and uh, this uh, like uh, birth house in uh, Mariupol was bombed they just uh, bombed uh, like uh, pregnant women and small children and uh, it's what is going on every day. So, you know, when uh, death falls from the sky, yeah, we need uh, the sky to be closed. But sure, when uh, I discuss this uh, question with uh, my European friends, mainly Germans, uh, they say that, yes, it will be the start of World War III. And... Uh, that it's unacceptable and uh, yeah I uh, don't uh, have much to answer because uh, these people like uh, think about uh, their own lives in the same way as we do and their governments like protect their own population and, uh, but yes, you would not want to compare it, uh, or compare it with uh, think about uh, a question of political representation during the war. It also very like uh, dual. Uh, but uh, there is one other aspect, like uh, during like last decade, Putin speaks about red lines all the time. And he crosses these red lines himself all the time. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, like United Europe really can protect itself by like passivity and by negotiating with Putin. Like uh, all is goes to catastrophe and now he's subjective, he's responsible. It's like uh, he uh, makes new and new steps. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure that uh, passivity can uh, save us all now. I understand. Uh, another important point that is not often discussed uh, while the preceding point is discussed every day, uh, what I'm going to say now is not so evident, I think. Um, this war is somehow being framed as a question of independence of an autonomous nation. Uh, while uh, I believe nationalisms are the seed of all wars and have proven to be tremendously negative in history. So I see this, and I would like your opinion after I finish summarizing my opinion. Uh, I was shocked when a university in Milano wanted to cancel the course on Dostoevsky, which to me would have been like canceling the course on Dante in Harvard in 1942, like crazy, you know? So I think it's very important to separate nationalisms from the war. And 
the history of Ukraine and the history of Russia are so very connected. And even your president speaks Russian fluently. And many people in Ukraine are um, a Russian or um, there, 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 there isn't necessarily an ethnic reason, I think. While what I do think is very important is the question of where a particular state, not nation, but state, wants to be in terms of political organization. So if the majority of the state wants to be in a democracy, in a liberal democracy with freedom of speech and certain forms of freedom that are connected with that political system, which is dominant in Western Europe, then it is enough for them to not want to be within the orbit of a, of a state, not a nation, a state that does not believe in the same form of freedom. Uh, so uh, I would like you to comment on whether you think this is a war that has to do with nations and nationalities or with this more political question of how a certain country and state wants to be run economically and politically. Yeah, uh, Carolina, what you said is quite uh, like obvious for me and uh, mostly I totally agree. You know, my position always was and still is anti-nationalist. And in a relatively peaceful time, most of my conflicts were with Ukrainian nationalists. They were attacking our exhibitions, they were attacking my curatorial activity in Kmitiv Museum where I dealt with Soviet art collection. So I'm Ukrainian anti-nationalist. And uh, for me, it's not uh, about even a deep connection with uh, Russian culture. Also, uh, I could uh, speak about connections with uh, Russian, with Polish, with Hungarian, with uh, Czech, with German cultures, all these influences like during Ukrainian history. And these influences are extremely important for us. And anyhow, I will continue reading like Dostoevsky or Harms or Hlebnikov independently from how this war will go on and what will be the finish. For me, these are like different issues and also a lot of like Russian, like artworks, like pieces of literature really helps us, uh, really help us uh, understand what we are dealing uh, with. It's about understanding of uh, Russia and also maybe understanding it through the lens of uh, Chadayev, like uh, early Russian dissident and genius who was uh, like considered a madman officially like in Russian Empire, who told that uh, somehow Russian catastrophes are the lessons for the rest of the world. Somehow in uh, different periods, different countries step into catastrophe, which turns to be a lesson to the rest of the world. And uh, it's also somehow about Germany, about Italy and maybe on uh, some new historical steps, it will be about countries which are now like a uh, bastion of uh, liberal democracy. Uh, but on the other hand, I am supportive with the idea of boycott, collaboration with a Russian state with those Russian state museums whose directors signed the letter of support of annexation of Crimea in 2014. Mm. 
Hmm. Like, you know, directors of biggest Moscow museums, of State Center of Contemporary Art, they signed the letter that we are totally supportive in a question of annexation of Crimea, we support our president. And yeah, I uh, had uh, like honor to refuse from like the show in garage together with Vlada Nakonichna and Mykola Ridna, Ukrainian artists from the Moscow Biennial, Moscow Young Artists Biennial. And just short time ago, I was invited to quite a well-known show Diversity United under patronage of Macron, Steinmeier, and Putin. And sure, I rejected this kind of proposal. Uh, so for me, it's not about canceling Russian artists or writers, no. Lots of them are just open anti-Putinists, but about canceling collaboration with Russian state and corporate money, which uh, supports Putin's war machine. So okay. there is a difference. Yes, I understand. Okay, let's uh, ask you about the relationship between art and art making and the artist and the society. So I often think, when I think about you in Kiev, I remember Manet, uh, on the barricades in Paris during the La Commune de Paris around 1870. And I remember the letters that I read that he sent to his wife, who was in the south of France. I believe they were sent by pigeons because Paris was under siege and he they were communicating with, with pigeons. Uh, I guess a little bit like Starlink right now, but of the time they could cross over the siege. Uh, what do you think is the capacity and the ability of an artist to impact positively this situation? And why are you doing what you're doing every day, talking to journalists and uh, setting up programs and projects like the one we are going to see in Castello di Rivoli shortly. So what is your feeling around the possibility of artists directly or indirectly to affect the world? Uh, it works on uh, different levels. In a situation of urgency, uh, it works like uh, some increasing visibility of Ukrainian catastrophe. Just we make an artistic event, we got uh, attention of cultural community and of mass media, and uh, the war in Ukraine becomes more world. But uh, on uh, longer terms, in a bigger distance, uh, Art works as an instrument of understanding. It uses the mechanisms of intuition and imagination to clarify the world. Even you know, this uh, like Heraclitian darkness of art, its untransparency makes the world more transparent. And uh, yeah, if it will work like in 2014, when uh, during the start of invasion in Donbass, Ukraine was in all media and uh, it was visible, represented. But uh, like a year after, like uh, it went a bit out of fashion and this wound was rotting in silence. Uh, it will give no like space, no room for art to make its work. Because, yeah, there is a second level, working on a long distance. And uh, for 
our screening in Castello de Rivoli, I tried to choose the works which uh, can make Ukrainian situation more and more transparent, more clear, more visible, but also to work on uh, reflection, to do this work of understanding, to, you know, to start maybe our common work of understanding Ukraine with, in relations with the rest of the world. So I hope uh, for longer distance as well. I am mm. really grateful for all the possibilities of uh, these projects, like in support of Ukraine, of these acts of solidarity. It's extremely important. But also I have a hope for the possibility to work on longer distance. Longer times. Yes. Um, so let's think about longer times. What are your plans? Will you leave if things get worse? Will you stay? Uh, what, what do you think will happen with you over the next days? Yeah, uh, Caroline, as you may know, uh, like uh, people of male gender cannot cross the border of the country anyhow and uh, there is still some possibility to move uh, to the western part of the country which is a little bit safer as for today we don't know what will be tomorrow for now i am staying in my gallery shelter i arranged uh, even a small uh, group show here like um, Having uh, some artworks around, including historical works of uh, Ukrainian, uh, like early 20th century modernism and uh, Ukrainian uh, Soviet non-conformist art from 70s and contemporary works as well. So I have an environment for myself and even some people who remained in the city, they uh, come to see the show, really during shellings, during uh, the siren from the sky. Mm. Uh, if I move to the west of the country, maybe I could be more like uh, useful, helpful in uh, terms of uh, helping internal refugees and, uh, um, you know, developing some uh, internal cultural life in a wartime. But uh, Western cities are a bit overloaded with people and uh, they seem uh, to be in quite a problematic, uh, even psychological condition. You know, while I'm stand, staying here in Kiev uh, for two weeks, my uh, mental health improved a lot. I am uh, in the best condition for for last two years. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, let's see. Maybe I'll move if I'll feel that uh, I need it and that I'll be more needed. Maybe I'll stay for a few more days, maybe for a week. Let's see. I have uh, this very, you know, like uh, low horizon of planning. Yes, uh, that brings me to the question of art heals, arte cura. Uh, you know, our museum was a vaccination center for COVID vaccination in the spaces of Claudia Conte last year. And she created uh, with a collaborator a soundtrack for the vaccinations. Uh, so as you may, you may know, since we worked together, years ago, I'm very interested in the relation between art and healing in general, coming from a kind of Melanie Klein um, background of thinking. Uh, but I always were thinking about the art and the audience, you know, and arte cura in terms of a society of the viewers. Uh, this, these days with you on the emails, 
I've been thinking that Larte Cura, also the artist, so <laughs> all the work that you've put in selecting these videos and in writing to the other artists and in writing the short synopses with Giulia Coletti and so forth uh, was somehow a form of therapy for you, for the artist, uh, which is both a very ancient idea, you know, and a very maybe uh, new idea. Uh, what do you think? Uh, yeah, uh, it can work uh, as a healing. Uh, sometimes it works like a healing with a small, uh, uh, like doses of poison. Sure. Like uh, art can work as a poison as well. It's but you mean very, so, so very the, dual. Yes, but but a poison you mean when it becomes um, propaganda? Uh, no, it's differently. Even like a deconstruction of propaganda narratives can work as a, like healing with a poison. That's very interesting. It brings us back to surrealism and to your roots, I think, in surrealist thinking. Uh, so very well. Now, that makes me think of Antigonna. I didn't know Antigonna's work until you showed me the work uh, uh, recently. Can you speak about this collaboration with your piece? Um, uh, I think it's called Liquid Skin. Uh, that is in the in the in in the videos that we are seeing, where you're also referring to uh, self-hurting, and um, how you worked with this other artist and who he or she or they is, and um, this kind of edge between the horror movie, the porno, and and the contemporary art video. Yeah. Antigona is uh, like a star of Ukrainian uh, underground queer scene. She makes uh, ongoing series of uh, so-called porn horrors. And uh, in a film, uh, Lucid Skin, I wrote uh, like scenario, a screenplay, and I played the main role of... Uh, um, uh, like a male person punishing himself for his uh, masculinity, like uh, uh, and uh, transforming it uh, into some sort of magic ritual. Actually, when I uh, like hurt my uh, face and body with a knife in this film, uh, I uh, do some sort of uh, like magics. And uh, then this person goes to some nightclub, like which uh, is like a safe non-binary space, but uh, just me as an entrance. Uh, this person is uh, attacked by uh, some like uh, brutal, aggressive, homophobic guys actually played by brilliant Ukrainian anarchist uh, pro-feminist artists. Actually, all the roles in film uh, are played by Ukrainian artists. Uh, How interesting. And hmm. uh, it's uh, one of uh, the longest series of Antigona's films. But in her practice, she uh, like uses the base of her own experience and uh, it's really like terrible experience, experience of rape, experience of violence. And uh, also her work deals a lot with like mental health issues. Uh, oh yeah, and her work was uh, censored a lot, like in Ukraine, in Poland, like uh, in Poland, uh, like there were 
like homophobic attacks on exhibition called Fear with her works. So exhibiting Antigona still somehow is very, very problematic. She's mm. very strong in her works and she goes on. Currently she's in Paris. She's a refugee. Mm -hmm. Are you making any art right now? Yes, I do drawings uh, in my shelter. I make sketches of some sculptures and installations. I work on some shows on uh, distance. Uh, but, uh, you know, like every day, I give uh, like five interviews, have to cook some hot food in other place to bring it here. And then in the very evening, I can draw and write a diary. Uh, so it's like quite a special working regime. Well, uh, maybe uh, if you'd like to add one last thing that is not an answer uh, to any question of mine, but something that I, you may have wanted to say, um, I would invite you to do so. And then perhaps we should watch these fantastic videos and films that you've sent over the over the ether to Castello di Rivoli. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yes, these uh, films were created in uh, different years by artists of uh, different generations. And um, I have a feeling that uh, all together they are like a, quite a deep and a complex story about what is Ukraine and um, what is the mode of survival and of life here. Even more, survival and life and death. Uh, most of these works could be treated as like openly political, but anyhow, all art is political. It's just about being consciously politically engaged or being a product of political relations. And uh, these works are politically engaged, but on very different levels. They exist on different levels of political reflection, like, uh, let's say, from journalism to philosophy. And, uh, yeah, they, uh, they have a lot of context. And this uh, screening is not uh, so, like, deeply prepared. It's an example of acting in a situation of urgency. But uh, I believe they give a lot of new knowledge to the audience and uh, that our project works both on short and a long time distance and thank you thank you very much uh, nikita so to everyone who's listening the instagram live will turn off very soon and we will be screening at Castello di Rivoli from 11 a.m. Uh, to 7 p.m. Uh, today, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, and this program is within a program called Espressioni, uh, Confrazione, a Fractional Expressions. Our museum is supported by the Regione Piemonte, uh, the city of Torino, the city of Rivoli, uh, the Fondazione Ceriti, the Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo, in this particular program, the Fondazione Ceriti per l'arte. <laughs> that was the commercial moment. Um, it will also be located on our Cosmo Digitale screened for those of you who are not here. Um, but it was important for us to also screen it physically in the museum and then you will be able to find it also on the digital cosmos uh, in the future, thanks to Giulia Coletti, who is the curator of the digital cosmos. So thank you, uh, Nikita. And uh, as of tomorrow, you can watch it also 
online, but now I wish you could be with us. And I invite you in advance now uh, to come uh, as soon as it's possible and this war is over. And we all hope that it will finish well uh, and that the diplomacy, all of the governments that are working uh, to weave together the diplomacy um, to, to finish this moment of violence will be successful. So uh, bye, Nikita, and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.